Good morning. Oh my goodness. Did y'all hear anything? I didn't hear anything. Let's try. Good morning. Hey, there we go. So I got missed. I ain't saying good morning. I think I saw a few yesterday. I tried to throw candy at a few people's heads. I did. I hit Sheena in the shin. She was limping this morning. <laughs> I hope everyone had a wonderful time with the parade yesterday. I tell you, it was absolutely beautiful weather, and uh, we certainly enjoyed it. Uh, my wife spent the day shooting a wedding up in South Carolina, so I know she's ready to be home. And uh, but we had a we've had a wonderful weekend so far. Uh, a few announcements. Uh, just some reminders. Um, children's workers, immediately following service, we're going to have a quick children's meeting right down front here. Uh, no need to wander off across the campus. We'll just have it right up front, so just come on up front. As soon as service is over, we're going to talk some kids stuff. Uh, reminder tonight, business meeting, uh, 6 p.m., so look forward to everyone being there for that. Uh, we've got some singing coming up here. Uh, see, we've got the 15th. We're going to be at Hillsborough Baptist Church at 4 o'clock and back here at 6 o'clock to do Messiah Heaven's Glory, a Christmas musical. Uh, we've got flyers out there in front of the nativity scene in the, uh, in the foyer there, so make sure you pick up some of those and invite friends and family to come and be a part. And then Wednesday, December the 18th at 6 o'clock is going to be our kids' Christmas program, and they've been working real hard on that, so we look forward to that. Uh, some reminders just for planning. We'll have no evening service on Sunday the 22nd, uh, but we will have a Christmas Eve candlelight service. Uh, December 24th at 6 o'clock, so we certainly look forward to uh, seeing all of you there. Uh, just a personal prayer request. Uh, most of y'all have seen the news of the, uh, the shooting that happened in Pensacola, and um, we've got friends who had family members on site in the building uh, when it happened, and uh, thankfully they came out okay, but I know it has shook that area down there, so just I encourage you to please remember the, uh, the community of Pensacola as they're um, dealing with something they haven't really seen before. So, uh, and I know there's a lot of folks that, um, you know, this time of year can be tough, and uh, we just need to be praying for encouragement and strength during this time. And uh, remember that this season is about the Savior of the world who came, that we could have peace and we could have hope. Uh, so let's just take a moment this morning and open up in a word of prayer. Uh, gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the reminder of this season. You sent your Son, who stepped willingly out of the glories of heaven, to come and be human here with us. Human God at the same time, but, but putting aside your deity so that you could live among us, God with us. And you did it that we could have freedom from sins. You did it that we could have a relationship with you. You did it so that we could have eternal peace and hope. And Lord, amidst all the, the struggles and the, and the stress of the, and the loss of the season that we all feel at times, Lord, I pray that you would help us to remember that, that you would give us peace because you promised peace on earth and goodwill to whom you favor. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to remember that peace and may we would just return to you all the glory and honor that you are so due, for it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. If you'll take a hymnal, turn to 181. We're singing Christmas now. Let's all stand as we sing, Joy to the World, the Lord has come. <laughs>
See everybody this morning. I hope you've had a good time so far. Really have enjoyed the choir singing. So I'm asking that you pray for them. Uh, they've got a double header coming up. They are actually going to go over to Hillsboro and they're going to sing over there and then they're going to leave that church and they're going to come over here and they're going to sing over here. So I'm going to get to hear it twice and I encourage you to do so. Hillsboro is not that hard to find. You just kind of head that way and it's right there on the left side of the railroad tracks and We'll have some directions for everybody. So, if you've noticed in our uh, bulletins, we've had several prayer requests put at the top. And over the weeks, we've, we've prayed over this and we've prayed over that. And last week was our Minister of Music. And uh, I didn't, didn't get to call Brother Jeff and Miss Diane down because Miss Diane was out of town with some family and I wanted to wait. And, and we've got the choir, Christmas Cantata, listed this week. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to start us out in prayer at the altar this morning. And I want to get Brother Jeff and Miss Diane to come down first, and then I'm going to get our choir folks right behind them, and you can get on what's left of the stairs. If you want to get up here in the choir chairs, sit on the front row, kneel with them, whatever. But I just want us as a church family just to pray for Brother Jeff and Miss Diane, and I want us to pray for our choir, and I want us to just pray for each other this morning. So I'm going to ask you to just come on down and get you a good spot. You gotta hurry up before all the good seats are taken. Let's just pray this morning for, for God's grace and God's peace and, and just thank Him for, for the goodness of these folks in our lives. Father, I thank you so much for your grace and your mercy. Lord, for looking past and hearing us, for forgiving us. Father, for being everything that we need, Lord. God, You've blessed this church. And Father, You've blessed us with a man of God to lead our music, and Brother Jeff. And God, You've blessed us with his godly wife, Miss Diane. And Father, how they work together in this church family, Lord. And I just thank You so much. And God, I know the struggles that they face, and You do too. And God, as we lift them up daily to You in prayer, Lord, that You would touch their bodies, God, touch their lives, touch everything of them, Lord, so that they can hear clearly from You, God, as they lead us. And God, I thank You so much for the wisdom that is in Brother Jeff. And the way for he, his mentoring to me, Lord, when I have questions, when I have concerns, Father, He's been there. And God, You've placed that in His heart in my life, God, to mentor to me, and thank You for that. And Lord, I thank You for this beautiful choir. God, how they just sing for You, Lord, and it's evident, Lord. God, I pray that You'd bless them. That, God, You would give them strength, Lord. We pray for our brothers and sisters from other churches that are going to sing with them, Lord. That You strengthen and encourage them, Lord, realizing that that's a witness. That folks are going to come to hear that, Lord, and they're going to get the Gospel and song, Lord. And God, we lift those up that can't be with us this morning because they're sick or they're hurting, or they're taking care of sick or hurting loved ones. Father, that you'd just be near and dear to them, Lord. Let them know that we miss them, and God, that we love them so much. Now, Father, for your word this morning. God, as we're looking at new beginnings, God, I pray that today that we would look inside ourselves. Do we need to start afresh? God, is there anything that we need to allow you to move from in front of us so we can do what you're calling us to do? God, we love you so much. Father, we just thank you for this time we're going to have together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank y'all so much. Everybody help everybody up. If you're like me, you got too much wind in your face yesterday. I want to thank everybody that had a great part of the Christmas parade. Um, it was a good time. I didn't get to do it as much fellowship and as I wanted to do, I had the donation bucket, so I was walking around and when somebody would drive up, before I'd give them directions, I'd kind of extort a little donation out of them, so, you know, judge me for that if you want, but we do have to have some funds to replace our flags and, and whatnot throughout our community, 
And uh, I, I want to thank uh, Brother Billy and, and, and Miss Jessica for riding on the, the wagon with Emma. We were pulling it. And thanks to the Smith family for letting me uh, drive Brother Jimmy and Miss Janie's tractor. And it's kind of comical. I've been working on that thing, and we're talking about new beginnings. Today I'm going to talk about preparing the way for the Lord. And you know, we're all preparing for Christmas, and we've been preparing for Thanksgiving, and we've been preparing this tractor for, for weeks. Emma and I have been running this thing around the house, and I had the Jeep, and she had the tractor, or I had the tractor, and she had the Jeep, and we were trying to see if we were going to be able to coexist and her drive something also in the parade, and been dealing with, with sediment in the gas tank, and, and, and I got cocky, and I wanted to ride... Billy and Jessica, the whole loop of the parade and drop them back off at their car and then drive the tractor all the way back home. And on the way back down to the school, I noticed something wasn't quite right. And uh, when we got to the school, it was evident something wasn't right. So we went and got the truck just in case. And almost home, it decided it was time for me to get to sit on the side of the road. So as I'm sitting there after all that preparation, I could just hear in the back of my mind my daddy saying, college boy, you're going to learn one of these days when it starts sputtering, that's when you stop and take care of it. But how much preparations are we doing in our life? Now we've prepared for Thanksgiving and we've ate meals and some of us may still be eating Thanksgiving meals. In the world we live in today, hey, you just get it when you can get it and if it's two weeks late, you know, so be it. But now we're in preparing for Christmas trying to get together with family, trying to buy gifts, trying to do this, trying to do that. There's a lot of preparations that's going into it. As I was getting ready this morning, I was thinking about how I always try to match my wife and how am I going to find something that matches her. And, and, and how did we go from where my daddy would just walk out and his clothes was laying on the bed to my wife saying, you just figured out. I, I think what my daddy did is he put something on that was so hideous and wore it somewhere that my mama said, I'll dress you from here on. So I may try that, okay? So just be forewarned, Misty. But preparing the way of the Lord. This morning we're going to look at three different passages of Scripture. So get your fingers out. Get them limbered up. Get them ready to go. The first thing we're going to look at, this is all going to be action verbs. We're going to look at bringing. To prepare the way of the Lord... You have to bring something. So turn with me to Isaiah chapter 40. And there's going to be a key verse in each of these three passages, even though we're going to read several verses in each, but there will be a key that we want to zone in on. So when you get to Isaiah chapter 40, you've got to understand who Isaiah is talking about. He's talking about a front runner, a forerunner. Somebody preparing. If you've ever gone to someone's home to eat a meal, you know the meal didn't just magically appear. They either had to prepare it or go purchase it or something went into actually preparing that. So somebody had to be the front runner, the preparation agent for Jesus Christ. And Isaiah is going to start prophesying all the way back in the Old Testament about that preparation. So in Isaiah 40... Verses 1 through 5, it says, Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, said your God. Speak you comfortably to Jerusalem, and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned. For she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Now verse 3 is the one I want us to key in on real quick. The voice of him that cried in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Now, the first thing in bringing is to bring comfort. And that was what Jesus was going to do. He was going to bring comfort to those that hurt. You see, a lot of times in church we say maybe we've never done it that way before, we've never seen it that way before. That was going to be Jesus' banner that was going to march before Him. 
you've never seen anything like this. He's going to bring a comfort that you have never known. He's going to bring a comfort against the internal warring over sin. He's going to bring a comfort over the external warring over sin. And there's coming this one behind me that I'm the front row for to bring comfort. Yesterday, you can always tell when a parade is well organized because you've got a lead and then the band, and then you've got the grand marshal. And you can see when the lead's coming, you know, you can hear the band playing, and then you're going to see that grand marshal, the ones that are honored for the parade. And that's how our life ought to be in bringing comfort to others. There's a sequence of events where the Holy Spirit has to convict you. Then somebody comes along that has that comfort in the form of Jesus Christ and we give our lives to Jesus. Bringing comfort and bringing an end to war. Perpetual conflict. Now what does the Bible say about war? In the end times there will be wars and rumors of wars. There will be this one turned against this one and all these things must come to pass. But also that nobody knows the day or the hour. Jesus said, I'm going to set a few folks against each other. Absolute disagreements. Have you ever seen more in your life than what we see now? People don't like you just because you don't agree with them over something. There is a definite one side and there is a definite the other side. And there is no common ground to meet in the middle. He was also coming to bring pardon for our iniquities, which is true forgiveness of sin. Now back in those days, if you'll remember, under the Mosaic Laws, there were sacrifices for a covering of the sins. And in Hebrews 10.4 it says, it wasn't possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins, so we had to have somebody to come that could literally take those away rather than just cover those up temporarily. Aren't you thankful for that? And at this time of year, at Christmas, that's what we celebrate Jesus coming to take away our sins. You know, do you really understand what love really is? A good friend of mine bounced me devotions and he bounced me one this morning talking about love. And I said, you know, I may not really understand love all the way until I see those nail-scarred hands. Until I'm able to fall on my face at the feet of those printed feet of Jesus Christ. I mean, I know the love of, of, of a spouse. I know the love of a child. The love of siblings. The love of parents. The love of brothers and sisters. I mean, I know that kind of love. But one true love that can really bring comfort. Outside of Jesus Christ, I don't believe there is one. So many times folks come and they say, I'm hurting. I need something. And it always leads to the conversation of, do you know Jesus Christ? Because apart from Jesus, there is no peace. There is no comfort. And that's what we ought to do in our daily lives is bring that to others. See, we're looking at John the Baptist here. We're going to get a little bit more deep in him, but can't we all be that in our daily lives? That we're a front runner for Jesus? Hey, I'm in the band and I'm marching and I've got somebody really great coming behind me. You just hide and watch until you see Him. I am preparing the way. Not just bringing, but number two, preparing. So let's look over to the book of Malachi. It's real easy to find. Just go to Matthew and hang a left. Malachi chapter 3. And I really tried to make uh, all of my things rhyme, but you can't come up with a great word for bringing that starts with a P. So I just had to make a B and then got a couple of P's following here. But Malachi is also another... um, uh, foreshadowing of what's to come in verses 1 through 5. And we're going to kind of zone in on that first one. And we're going to kind of hear a common theme in this, which ought to be a common theme to God's people. We are trying to prepare the way of the Lord in somebody else's life by looking at us and seeing how we live and how we speak and how we interact and bringing that gospel to somebody. You see, we're a forerunner. And what better time of year than to do it during Christmas when Christ is with us. So in Malachi chapter 3, if your Bible's like mine, it's on page 616 by the way, it says, Behold, I will send my messenger, 
and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom you delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. He shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old and, and as in former years. And I will come near to you to judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against false swearers and against those that oppress and hireling that oppress hireling in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger from his right, and fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. So not only are we bringing, but we ought to be preparing. And that's what we see John is preparing for the arrival of something. Now in your daily life, do you prepare for the arrival of something? I live and die by the UPS tracking device in my office. Because people ship me stuff by UPS all the time, and I've got to know when it leaves, when I'm going to be able to inspect it, how much time I got before I can drop it back off and have it shipped to somebody. And there are places in this world that you cannot ship next day, right here in the United States of America. You can't ship something today and get it there tomorrow. That sounds hard to believe, but there are places that you have to load it up on something else to get it there, and you, two days is going to be tough. But I'm always preparing for something. We were blessed to have the deacon families over to our home Friday night, and we were preparing, which means we were cleaning. You know, you got to get the cobwebs and everything else and whatever else. And, and Misty sometimes jokes she likes to have people over because that's when the house is the cleanest. Y'all can just judge me if you want, but that's true. Because we live there, right? And that's what we tell people when you come in. Hey, we live in this house. We don't just set off to the side and use it just on special occasions. So you have to prepare. So what is John doing? He's preparing for an arrival. Malachi is predicting about John who's going to be predicting about Jesus. You see how this is going? Somebody's predicting somebody else that something really great is going to happen. And it may be that in your life, if you know Jesus Christ, somebody predicted to bring the Gospel so that you could come to know Jesus and guess what you were to do? Pass it on forward. It may be that it's passed through a couple of folks to get to you and you've got the key to somebody that nobody else has. Preparing the way of the Lord. Preparing means to make ready. And preparing for that arrival, which means somebody is coming. Has somebody ever came into your heart? It's a great place to put that plug in here. Do you know Jesus? Have you ever had a time when you gave your life to Christ? John was preaching the preparations of cleansing, purifying, removing the things that do not belong, burning off the impurities. A silversmith story that I read one time, and I, I've never done that. I've been around molten aluminum. That's about the hottest, nastiest thing I've ever been around. But they say a silversmith, he'll take that silver and he'll put it in the fire and pull it out and put it in the fire and he's constantly working it. And they say, how do you know when it's ready to pour up when I, when I can see myself in that image? That pool, that puddle. Now you imagine Christ burning those things off in our life. Hey, you're a little too close to this. Let me get rid of it for you. Hey, you got a little too much invested in this. Let me get rid of it for you. Let me get you down to where I want you to be so I can see my image in you. That's what John is going to say. Prepare you the way of the Lord. Not only that, but preparing for judgment. Man, wouldn't it be great if we could just sit down every day and eat a meal of, of cake and ice cream? Wouldn't that be awesome? Or whatever your favorite food is. We saved up and bought some pecan, chocolate pecan pies. We got one of them. And I thought, man, a chocolate pecan pie, how much better can life get? I mean, and I'm the only one in my house that likes it. So hallelujah, that's just more for me. So I'll get me a big old piece of that and microwave it, scoop me some ice cream on it and eat it. And it's great up until my stomach starts killing me about bedtime. And I'm thinking I'm getting to the point in life where i got to start cutting those things off. 
You know, it'd be great if we could eat just what we wanted with no consequences, right? It would be great to talk about how wonderful Jesus Christ is without speaking of any consequences. It would be great to say how in this life you can have anything you want without saying you don't need this, you don't need this, you don't need that because there are consequences. Why do they make cars that have speedometers that have 160 on it when you're not allowed to drive 160 miles an hour? It would be great to be able to do that, but how many wrecks would we have as a consequence of that? In verse 5, he says, I'm going to be a swift witness against some things. You ever had swift judgment brought on you? It may be that you're in the back seat of the car and you're running that mouth a little bit more than mom or dad wants and they bring that swift judgment on you. Or you come over the top of the hill and you're driving a little faster than you ought to and that state trooper that's been running the four lane out here in the work white Chevy truck some of y'all know who I'm talking about. He sees you and he pulls you over to have a little talk with you. It's swift. It's not tomorrow I'll come see you or next week I'll come knock on the door. It's right now. And that's what Jesus come to do. To bring it swift. And you know what? It needs to be swift. It doesn't need to be slack. It doesn't need to let off. It needs to be for those that need to be judged. We need judgment to bring us comfort. We need to know where the bounds of play are. But swift means we won't see it coming. You ever hurt yourself and you saw it coming? Now it might have been life comes to a standstill and your life flashes before your eyes in slow motion as it happens, but somebody else is just like this. We have to do a lot of classes on uh, safety. You know, I used to do a lot of them when I was in die casting because there are things you just don't do. But it can happen just like that. Has life ever came at you like that? We were talking about Sunday school this morning about how when you get outside the will of God, God will let you only go so far until you're either so miserable you can't stand yourself or you do something about it. It's a slow fade sometimes. Not just bringing, preparing, but lastly, preaching. So let's go to Matthew chapter 3. Just a couple of pages to the right. Trying to make it easy on you this morning. Matthew chapter 3. And we are going to read about the one that was prophesied of in Isaiah. We're going to read about the one that was prophesied in Malachi. We're going to read about the one that is going to be the forerunner for Jesus Christ. He's going to say, prepare you the way of the Lord. And in Matthew chapter 3, the first 12 verses as follows. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Esaias, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? He didn't mention no words, did he? Bring forth those fruits that meet for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid under the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the shaft with unquenchable fire. John was pre- preaching repentance, was he not? I mean, I can just imagine hell, fire, and brimstone preaching. I mean, just ranting and snorting and carrying on and sweating like a bull at an auction. I mean, all those things that you hear of, I can just imagine him saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We preach it in John's day, we're preaching it in our day, but how many people believe the kingdom of heaven is at hand? 
How long are we going to be on this planet? How much longer have we got? God is coming back and He is coming back soon. Amen or oh me? But we live like we got the rest of our life to get things right, don't we? We live like we've got another hundred years or another however many years. We've got all the time that we need. Time is a very precious commodity when you don't have much of it. God is coming back soon to make His new heaven. Will you be in it? He's preaching repentance. He's preaching simplicity. I want you to contrast what John is wearing. John is wearing camel's hair. Now, I don't know how many of us in Lawrence County have ever had a chance to rub up on a camel, but it's not real great stuff. He's wearing camel hair and he's got a leather belt around him. And you contrast that to the lifestyles of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. We usually talk about Pharisees and scribes, but Pharisees and Sadducees are a lot alike, but they're a lot different. The Pharisees claim Mosaic authority for their interpretation of Jewish laws while the Sadducees represent the authority of the priestly privileges and prerogatives established since the days of Solomon. If you remember Paul, when he was being held as accountability in the court, he actually played the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees against each other so the Romans would come in and take him before chaos broke out because the Romans wanted to punish him. They didn't want him being punished by those folks. But just imagine the simplicity of John. Versus the finest clothing that you can find that could be made. You see some of those photographs of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and they've got the ornate headdresses, and they've got the things that come off and flow to the front, the robes, and they were fat from eating anything they wanted to eat and living anyway. They had the, as my daddy would say, the lily white hands. They never mashed a finger in their life. I mean, they sat in judgment of anybody and everybody, and they had it made, and here's. Poor old John the Baptist out there wearing a coat made out of camel skin preaching, you better get your heart right. you got those that are judging you for the things that you've done wrong and you've got the one saying there's going to come a time and you better be ready. There's those that are saying you'll never be good enough so give up now versus one saying there's hope and I'm here to prepare the way. Simplicity reaching to every nook and cranny of society. Meaning the coming, coming Messiah was for everyone, not just the rich and the powerful. Riding through that parade yesterday. Worried about that engine keeping up, keeping the throttle just right, trying to keep it up, not running over kids, not running over candy. And I'd get, catch a glimpse of souls. It was already an emotional day for me. But I got to wondering, God, how many of these folks know You? Folks sitting right here in this parking lot, do they know You? Should I be shouting, prepare You the way of the Lord. There's going to come a day. Are You ready? The difference between what we've heard being prophesied what we just read about John is John preached consequences. He said in verse 10, the axe is at the root. He didn't say it was at the stump. He didn't say it was at the limb. He said it was at the root. We've got this stuff that's growing on the property line between us and and, and Brother Jeff back there. It's called privet. And it can have a stump that grows you know, as far out as it wants to go. When I had Brother Dennis's dozer over there, I was pushing, I would push up a root ball that would just keep digging. And the only way to stop that stuff, in my understanding and experience, is to dig it up by the root. You can take a chainsaw out there and you can cut that stuff down as low as you can cut it and come back next year and it's grown back up. You can break the limb off so it quits slapping you in the head with a lawnmower and it'll straighten up and it'll keep growing. The only way to stamp out that is to get it up by the root. And that's what John is saying. He's saying, this one that's coming after me, he's not going to just knock a few limbs off. He's not just going to come in and cut you down at the stump 
so there's a chance for it to grow back. He's got it all the way down at the root. He's going to dig up everything and chop off every bit of life. And He's going to do that for the trees that are not bearing fruit. They're going to be cut down and they're going to be cast into the fire. It's going to be like the wheat growing with the tares. They're growing together. And you can't tear the tares up without tearing up the wheat. So they're all standing there and the tares are saying, you know, I look just like the wheat. I'm about the same color and I'm growing about the same. And the Master said, don't dig them up. Just wait until the harvest time. And when the harvest time comes, I will separate them myself. I will dig them up by the root. The wheat I will gather to myself and the tares I will throw in the fire. And when you get that harvest time, the wheat, just because it's pulled up or cut up, it's not over. He goes on in verse 12 to talk about having a winnowing fan in his hand. They take this wheat and they lay it all out and they crush it. And they crush it on something so that they can either fluff it up to get the chaff separated from the wheat or they take a big fan and they start fanning it. And what that does is it blows the stuff that's not needed away. Has God ever took a winnowing fan to your life? You ever been crushed and then all that stuff that doesn't do anything for God's glory just gets fanned away into the wind? Have you ever been there? Then you know what it's like for God to get your attention. That chaff, that unwanted part is going to be burned with an unquenchable fire, the Bible says. How many people in our life are nothing but chaff? They don't know Jesus Christ. They don't have any meat of the Gospel in them. And when the time comes, they're just going to be blown away and burned in that unquenchable fire. John said we need to be preparing the way. Do you see the resemblance in these two stories? What happens to the unwanted part? They're both burned. There's going to come a time for some folks when they're going to stand in judgment. And they're going to say, I did all these great things. I preached. I teached. I taught. I worked. I was raised in church. I was a good old boy. I was a good old girl. I did anything anybody ever needed. I tithed. I, I didn't cheat on my taxes. I never kicked a dog in my life. They're going to give you every excuse in the book. And what's going to be said to them? Depart from me, you who work iniquity. I never knew you. A couple of questions to end up with. What are we bringing for a new beginning? I want us to all put ourselves in the position of John the Baptist in our life. There are those that come by that know a whole lot more than we do. There are those that come by that may have it a lot better than we do. But we're on a mission field. Our job no matter how we're dressed, no matter where we live, no matter what circumstances we roll in, if you know Jesus Christ, you've got a job, and what are you bringing to this world so that it can have a new beginning? In just a very short few weeks that the Lord tarries, we'll all have New Year's resolutions. Man, I'm going to eat less ice cream, I'm going to work out more, I'm going to eat more ice cream, I'm going to work out less. Whatever your New Year's resolutions are going to be, you're already preparing for that new beginning in your life. You're going to get up and you're going to say, today is a new day. Today I start exercising every day. Can you make it till Thursday? Can you make it to the weekend? There are those in our life that need something from us. They need us to bring something so they can have a new beginning. And it's going to be partly like comfort. Do you know anybody that's hurting? How many times have I had opportunity to sit down with folks and ask them, about their church family and they don't have one. And they are really, really struggling. They don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. They don't have that peace that when this life is over, they go to the afterlife with God. It might be that we need to talk to somebody about forgiveness. Jesus said, Come unto Me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take My yoke upon you. You give me your yoke, I'll give you my yoke, Jesus said. Mine is fitted so well, you won't even realize it's on you.
Man, what a great yoke that is. What are we bringing to others for a new beginning? Next question. How are we preparing for the new beginning? There's always something to be dealt with. There's always something to start over. You've got to wipe the slate clean. You've got to take the pencil eraser and erase the page. You've got to wipe the screen off and start again. How are we preparing in our life for a new beginning? It may be that today we can say, God, I'm going to become that soul winner You've been convicting me to be. How will we do that? By cleaning. We're going to have to clean a few things. We may have to clean our mouth. We may have to clean our mind. We may have to clean our attitude, which is a cleansing. Which is getting rid of all those things in our life that don't belong, that are not godly, realizing it's not about us. It's all about God, which ends up with confessing. God, I did this. God, this is mine. I own it. It was wrong, and I know I did it, and I'm sorry, and I ask You to forgive me of that because I need to be prepared for a new beginning. Lastly, are we preaching? What are we preaching about the new beginning? I'm not a preacher. Yes, you are. I'm not called if you know Jesus. Yes, you are. Do we live like Jesus is coming back? As a child of God, are we living like there's going to come a day when God in, in the flesh is going to be right there in front of us? In the Spirit. However you imagine it, God is here with us. Do we actually believe that and are we living like that? We get so bogged down in this life, in this day, in this, 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 that we forget about that, that, that. Do we live like there's an eternity? Or once we spin around this globe, it's over with? He who dies with them always wins. I gotta make money. I gotta do things. I gotta vacate. I gotta have all this. I, 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 instead of God, God, God. Are we concerned about the souls around us? Do you believe God could call you into action in a moment's notice? Do you believe sometimes your day's not going according to plan? Maybe because it's according to God's plan? Yesterday when I got off that tractor, my heart was on going home and getting my tractor going. I don't know. I've laid hand on it. I've had conversations with it. and That's how I got the other one running. I said, you got two choices. you either going to run or I'm going to string your guts out all the way across this shop. It's up to you. I got time if you got the, the ability to see your insides on the outsides. I wanted to do all these things when I got done, and my wife said, I'd like to go shopping, just me and you. I got to have another shower before we can go anywhere. I didn't put my nasty clothes back on. Okay, we'll just, you know, we, I, we, it's okay. So I'm on the way to go shopping, and I'm starving to death. I've had a little bit of stuff wore on. She said, would you like to go eat before we go shopping? I said, absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Please. So we went and ate and we had our meal and it was awesome and we're shopping and we're finding some things that we can't live without and the phone rings. It's a dear friend. Hysterical. Her mother is being rushed to the hospital at Florence and needs somebody. And where are we at? Three minutes down the road. They're not in church. We talked about this. Of all the people that could have been called. Was it luck that our number was on the top of the list? Do you realize that your number may be on the top of somebody's list? And you may have your day already planned out. I'm going to go over here and I'm going to do this and I'm going to go over there and I'm going to do that when God says no. You're going to get a phone call. Are you going to receive that phone call or just cancel it out? You see, we are called to prepare the way of the Lord. If you know Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior, you have a job to do. And that is prepare the way in your life and where you live and where you work and where you interact to bring other souls into the kingdom of heaven. Are you doing that? 
Maybe you can't do that because number one, you don't know Jesus Christ. There has never been a time that you gave your life to Jesus. Or maybe there has been a time that you gave your life to Christ and you've never followed on through. You've never followed through the believer's baptism, never made a public profession of faith. You may have done it in a dark corner somewhere and said that's all good. It's not. Or it may be that you followed through, but you're not serving. God is only willing to go with you as far as you're willing to go with Him. He'll stand there and wait on you for a while. But it gets awful lonely. Are you preparing the way of the Lord? I'm going to ask you to bow your head.